have the great privilege to be able to work with all of our uh, STEAM professors here at the college. Um, as you can see, we've been uh, blessed with an amazing uh, facility here, uh, our Health and Science Building, uh, all made possible by the community and many others. So thank you for this. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Coiner here in just a second, and he's going to tell you a little bit about our guest tonight. Uh, but we always like to start to kind of talk a little bit about, uh, for a couple minutes, about things that we have going on with our STEAM Pathways, which is a lot. <laughs> Um, we have an amazing group of student researchers. Uh, they go by the name of Sphere. And we've actually uh, recently kind of um, extended more uh, options for the, uh, before they were kind of more focused in physics and engineering and astronomy. But uh, recently we now have our geology and chemistry professors uh, jumping in and we're excited to uh, find opportunities for the student researchers student researchers to be able to get some hands-on experience with that. It's things that is really going to benefit them in their lives. Um, great with scholarships and applications to other colleges when they transfer and even within their career. Um, they, I could sit there and list all the different projects that they're working on right now, but there would be many. So um, I don't want to take up too much of uh, Dr. Siemens' uh, time tonight, but one other thing I wanted to mention was if you have any uh, K-12 students or if you have some uh, somebody you'd like to share it with, we have an upcoming uh, K-12 event. This is actually for third to sixth graders. We're calling it STEAM for Kids. Uh, some of you might have heard of recently we had a STEAM for Teens event and it went over very well. That's seventh to twelfth grade. Uh, third to sixth grade is STEAM for Kids and we have that coming up on the second Tuesday. February 6th, I'm sorry, first Tuesday of February, <laughs> long day, uh, first Tuesday of February at um, right, actually right here is where we start and then the kids get to go and work with some of our professors on some awesome activities and they also get to experience our brand new portable planetarium. Uh, we have this amazing planetarium that we're able to actually take with us anywhere. Um, as long as we have a space um, that is safe for and large enough to set up. Um, with that said, it is actually going to be at the Coos Bay Fire Department tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning, if you would like to stop by and see it. That is a community and all free event. Uh, Dr. Coiner and myself will be over there. Um, and again, just please uh, follow us on social media, on Facebook. We've got all the uh, SWAC. Uh, the website, uh, we, for future events, these lectures will continue. Last week we had an awesome um, geology lecture and there's going to be even more coming soon. Um, if you're not a social media person, that's okay too. We also put a regular press release out and try to get this information out to our local newspapers, radios, um, and then if you have any other ideas, we do put up flyers and put them up in libraries and local things. So if you ever have an idea of like, hey, this, this would be really great if you can get this information over here, please pass it on. Out front here, I do have some handouts and some other things set up along with a, my card. If you have any questions um, that you might think of later or if you'd like to get in contact with us. Uh, I am connecting with local K-12 educators to see how we're able to support their education. Uh, there's student education, so if you also have any local K-12 educators that would be interested in connecting with us, please send them my way. So with that said, here is Dr. Coiner. He is over our physics and engineering department, and I will let him tell you about our very special guest tonight. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I had the privilege of hearing uh, Dr. Siemens give a talk a couple of years ago at an Oregon Space Grant Consortium meeting. And anytime I'm hearing about something um, such as gravitational waves, it always piques my interest, not that I fully understand it, but it's always, but it's always, a, it's, it's always one of those topics that, that catches my interest, and I know it catches the interest of several of our students that I've talked to over the, over the last few weeks. So, um, we are very glad to have uh, Dr. Javier Siemens here from um, Oregon State University. He also 
is one of the one of the leads for the nanograv experiment and the nanograv physics uh, frontier center um, discussing the interesting things that have come out of 15 years of the nanograv data and with that i will hand it off to you and Thank you for the kind introduction. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I like to uh, have talks be like relatively informal. So if you have any questions as I'm talking, just raise your hand. I'm having temporary hearing problems, so I'm going to ask you to speak loudly. And I will repeat your question too for the for the folks who are on uh, watching the stream, so so that they know what you're asking. Um, and if that turns out to use up a little too much time, um, then. Uh, then I can just skip the slides at the end. I'd rather answer your questions as we go along than, than I think it's more fun for everybody. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, the, uh, an announcement that we made in June of this, of this year um, involving um, what we detected was something called a stochastic background, which is um, a, a, a hum or a din uh, in space-time itself. And, it's, and it turns out we think is produced by the mergers of supermassive black holes that meet each other when gal after galaxies collide. So I will tell you all about um, that story, uh, how, that, how that comes about. Uh, before that, I wanna tell you, just give you a brief introduction to gravitational waves, and then also, um, uh, I, I will th actually start talking about a different experiment, which I also worked on for about 15 years. Uh, before working on on the, on the nanograv experiment, which is LIGO that you, you you've probably heard about, so yeah, gravitational waves are are ripples in space time, and uh, just like light, they propagate at the speed of light, and their effect is to change the the light travel time or the distance uh, between objects. And if a gravitational wave is going into the board, uh, what it does is it will stretch and squeeze that ring of particles a ring of particles. So, so as the gravitational wave is passing through, it's pulling the top one down at the same time as it's stretching this outwards and vice versa, right? As the wave is passing through, it's, 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 that, is the eff that is the physical effect of a, of a gravitational wave. And we measure um, the, uh, the strength of the gravitational wave using a quantity called the strain, which is the, um, uh, the fractional displacement of, say, the top mass, the, the blue mass at the top, relative to its equilibrium position. So when it's in a circle, if it moves up by a little bit, that little bit divided by the radius of the circle, that's, a, that's how we measure the strength of, of, of gravitational waves. There's a bit of an echo, by the way. I don't know. Okay. Is this better? Oh, God, this is so much better. Okay, yeah. That was really bugging me. <laughs> okay, good, good, okay. Um, right, so, so I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about LIGO first because uh, LIGO f detected gravitational waves back in, in 2015. They made the first detection in, in, um, in, in 2015. And if you think back to our ring of particles, uh, you can get a pretty good idea of how LIGO works. Um, so, so LIGO, they have a laser, and they shoot a laser or beam splitter, and then the beam splits into two, uh, uh, goes along two paths. Um, and then at the end, um, it hits, uh, at, at the end there, you see at the, the in the middle, there's, there's, a, there's a diagram there with, with like a Y-shaped or a V-shaped. At the ends of the V are two mirrors that bounce the laser light back. Uh, and then they recombine the light, and, by look and the light is a wave and it interferes. And by looking at the interference pattern that, that the light forms, um, they can track the, the motion of the mirrors. We, we can track the motion of those mirrors. And if you imagine a gravitational wave going into the board, so the, say the top blue mass is one of the mirrors, the one at 90 degrees to that um, is, is another one of the mirrors as the gravitational wave is passing through. It's, it's moving those mirrors around. And, and we are keeping track of that motion by shooting light to those mirrors and then recombining that light and keeping track of the interference pattern. Um, and I worked on this, this is a beautiful experiment, really successful experiment. I, 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 I worked on it for about 15 years, and these are two of the sites. So there's a, there's a schematic at the top there, but these are, this is the site in, in Hanford, Washington, which is not that far away from here. Um, maybe, well, it's about a seven hour drive or so from here. Um, and then um, uh, another one in the swamp in Louisiana. And um, 
they, uh, they have made, since the first detection uh, in 2015, this is September 2015 was when we detected it, and then um, in, uh, since then there have been of order 100 or so um, uh, binary systems. And what, what LIGO is detecting is these binary systems of two black holes orbiting around one another. And, um, and here's, here's a, a, a movie of this. Uh, and so this is a, a smaller black hole and a lar orbit, uh, going around another uh, larger black hole and then merging together. And what you see in the grid, the pattern in the grid, is uh, gravitational waves sort of uh, represented, depicted in, in two dimensions that are flowing away out of the, 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 the system. And, um, and, and in our detector, the gravitational waves look like these um, kinds of functions called chirps. So this is the... On the y-axis here is a strain, is that quantity that I was talking about earlier, you know, how much fractional displacement there is and how, mu how much squeezing or stretching there is um, as a function of time. And what, what's going on here is that the two black holes are orbiting around each other. As they're doing so, they're losing energy and they're coming closer together. Because they're closer together, the gravitational force is greater, that makes the spin even faster. So they're going out faster and faster and faster around each other, emitting ever stronger and higher frequency gravitational waves. And that, that's what... Um, <coughs> that's that's what that's what we refer to as a chirp. So here, the amplitude of this of this of this oscillation of the sinusoid is increasing, and also its frequency is increasing. It's yeah. getting it's getting higher and higher pitch. And I'll and I'll play a sound of, of that for you in a, in a second. So so um, one of the coolest discoveries, for, well, I think the coolest discovery actually to date that LIGO has made is one well, that happened in 2017. Uh, which was a binary neutron star. So LIGO has access to, uh, LIGO can see gravitational waves from binaries with component masses of a few to a few tens of solar masses. So like of order one or so to say a hundred solar masses, e each, of the, each of the objects that is merging. In this case, it was two neutron stars. Um, and for the first time, we detected a, um, um, oh, I think I have to turn on the sound for this, so you can hear the chirp. Okay, but I'll turn it off after I'm done, because then so there won't be any echo. Um, and um, and and we we detected not only the gravitational wave, but also uh, we detected it using electromagnetic observations. And what I'm one of the, the the plot that I'm showing up at the top is the plot that was observed in gamma rays, but we detected this across the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. So radio waves, optical, you name it, we saw it in, 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 that, in, in that band. So let me just turn this on and brave the feedback for just one second. <laughs> okay, so That's that first sound that you heard, the ooh, as it goes up in, and it gets louder and it goes up in frequency, the pitch is increasing, right? turn off my sound here the the pitch is increasing and so and, and and the amplitude is also increasing that's that chirp right the ding that you heard that's nothing that nature I mean that's that was just a, that was just for fun uh, <laughs> gamma rays don't sound like that um, and but we were able to to determine that that this um, this gravitational wave event what you're showing here is the frequency increasing as a function of time um, and this slight excess in gamma rays were actually related. And we actually found the galaxy, we identified the galaxy that it came from, we determined how far away it was. And um, what we were able to determine from these observations, which is really kind of mind blowing, is that, so this, this is my wedding ring, it's a, it's a gold wedding ring. This was once a part of a neutron star. We know this now, thanks to this observation. Uh, and that's a remarkable thing to be able to learn from something um, uh, uh, from something like a gravitational wave observation. Uh, and and, and the, the reason is that we, we there are questions about how elements heavier than iron are formed, right? So if you have a star, the way stars are fueled is by fusion. So you take hydrogen, you fuse it into helium, that helium fuses again and so on, and crea creating a, a ch uh, uh, um, heavier and heavier elements. But this process stops at iron because elements that are heavier than iron, when you fuse them together, they need energy, they don't release energy. And so it's not energetically favorable to have large amounts of anything heavier than iron, iron fusing in a star. You just don't get it. The, the way you get those heavier elements is by having 
clumps of neutrons, people thought, uh, that uh, come out of, of, of neutron stars, for example, which have a lot of neutrons in them. And then neutrons on their own are not stable. They will decay into protons. And so, um, and so the idea is that elements that are heavier than iron are either formed in, well, are, are formed in situations, astrophysical situations, where that kind of a process is possible. Um, supernova is an example of such a, of such a uh, kind of astrophysical phenomena. So exploding stars um, could produce this, uh, but also neutron star binaries. And there was the question of, well, you know, if a neutron star binary collides, you know, does it produce enough ejecta to account for all the gold that we see in the universe? And this observation proved that they did. And that, that's a remarkable thing. So if you own a piece of gold, you should know that it was once upon a time part of a neutron star. All right, so LIGO has um, detected gravitational waves and they're doing amazing science. Um, so why do we, why, why should we be searching for more, uh, for more of these? Um, and, and the answer is that when we've looked at the universe with different wavelengths of light, so you know, traditionally astronomy for the, for the vast majority of history, astronomy was done with, with people, with, with, with your eyes, with visible light uh, and, and optical telescopes. But um, starting in the 20th century, you started to see radio astronomy, X-ray astronomy, infrared astronomy, UV astronomy, and each of those, um, each of those um, observations of these different wavelengths of light paint a completely different and complementary picture of the universe. So we see very different things depending on how, what kind of light we used to observe it. And so there's a picture over there on the on the bottom, uh, on the bottom left here with the universe and how we see it at all these different wavelengths of light. And we expect a similar boon from gravitational waves, right? We can observe gravitational waves using LIGO in a particular range of gravitational wave frequencies, but we are hoping, and we have succeeded, we were hoping and we succeeded, um, at doing an experiment at a completely different gravitational wavelength to probe completely different astrophysics, to probe co a completely different um, uh, sources of these of these of these gravitational waves. So, like I mentioned, LIGO is sensitive to um, uh, binary systems that orbit around one another and produce these chirps, uh, where the components uh, that are merging are a few to a few tens of solar masses. So, a few to uh, uh, a few to a few tens times the mass of the sun. Um, and um, and so they're all the way sort of up here at the oops down here at the at the shortest uh, gravitational wave periods, or the highest frequencies. Um, and then you can imagine other gravitational wave periods. There's, uh, this is us, we're sitting down here. Our, our, our gravitational wave periods are years to decades. Okay, so this is a very long-term experiment that we're doing. Uh, it takes a, takes a very long time to do, a lot of patience. Uh, although, you know, to be fair, it also took about 40 years to between the idea of LIGO and when it came to fruition, that, that was about that was about about forty years as well. Um, but but in, in in our case, our the, the the changes in our experimental apparatus occur over those timescales, occur over the timescales of years uh, or, or decades. Um, uh, there's another uh, experiment, a really cool experiment called LISA, which stands for the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. The European Space Agency just approved that, I think yesterday or the day before yesterday. So they just adopted that as a mission. So that is going to go up in the 2030s. Uh, and that can probe gravitational waves periods with minutes to hours. And then there's experiments also looking at the cosmic microwave background. So the, the ba basically the background light of the universe, that the, the, the light of the Big Bang, um, the remnant light of the Big Bang from the universe, um, where we can also try to detect gravitational wave signatures that are embedded in that light. So those are the four kind of experiments, and two of them are, are, are ongoing. Uh, sorry, three of them are ongoing. So LIGO, Nanograv, and, and the Cosmic Microwave Background are experiments that are currently uh, happening. So let me, let me now talk a little bit, um, a, a little bit about Nanograv. And, and I mentioned <coughs> a little while ago that um, our sources are um, very, very massive black holes. They produce these gravitational waves with periods of years to decades. And I want to talk about how that, how that, um, how these sources turn out to be uh, uh, our most promising ones. To, to start with, um, 
Uh, we need to understand that as you look further, and I'm sure all of you understand this, but it's, it's, worth, it's worth reiterating, uh, that as you look further and further away, you're seeing things as they were longer and longer ago. So the moon, for example, is one light second away. It takes light one second to travel from the surface of the moon to your eye, about. So when you're looking at the moon, you're not seeing it how it is now, you're seeing it how it was a second ago. You've probably also heard uh, that the sun is about eight light minutes away. So when you look at the sun, boom, suitable uh, eyewear, <laughs> um, uh, you're seeing it how it was eight minutes ago, right? Uh, Alpha Centauri, four light years away. When you look at light from Alpha Centauri, you're seeing it how it was um, uh, four, four years ago. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, as, y as you look at things that are further and further away from you, you're seeing as they were, as they were longer and longer ago, and that's a, s that's a consequence of the finiteness of the speed of light. So the speed of the light just takes time to get to you. That's it. Um, and, and so when you, when you look at, um, so, so the story of how supermassive black holes become our most uh, uh, promising sources of gravitational waves begins with a puzzle, uh, which is <coughs> that if you look at nearby galaxies, so galaxies that are near us, uh, near our galaxy, they tend to be large and, uh, and mostly structured. So there's things like ellipticals or barred ellipticals and, um, sorry, uh, spirals or bar spirals or giant ellipticals. Those, those objects are very large and they're, and they're, and they're more, more structured. Um, if you look at distant galaxies, um, uh, and this is an, uh, an image of the, of, the Hubble, of the Hubble deep field, so these are this is, this, these are galaxies maybe as they were billions of years ago. So you so you're you're seeing them how they were billions of years ago. When you look at those, they're kind of small uh, compared to nearby galaxies, and not just because they're far away. Like you you count the amount of light that they're emitting, you're like, oh, there are fewer stars in this galaxy. Um, these galaxies are really smaller. Um, and and so the question arises is you know how do these uh, uh, small irregular galaxies that we see in the past turn into the large structured, you know, uh, barred, uh, barred uh, spirals and giant ellipticals that we see around us today. Um, so how does that evolution happen from, you know, we take a snapshot of the distant universe, that's how the universe was a long time ago, and it looks different than it is around us, which is how it is now-ish. Yeah, these things could still be some millions of light years away, but that's still now <laughs> uh, in, this, in this talk. Um, so, so how does this happen? And, and the idea is that, um, uh, the, the idea the, that people have is that galaxies grow by colliding and annealing. Um, so you have small galaxies earlier on, they find other small galaxies, they collide with those, those slightly larger ones then collide and again and again in a hierarchical tree of mergers that makes the population of galaxies uh, grow to be the size and have the structure that we observe them to have today, yeah. Some of this has been fluctuating, but I know some of our listeners online uh, can hold on. Okay, okay, we'll do, we'll do. Yeah, and and again, uh, so if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. We're not. Um, we can. Um, okay, so that what that that that's the that's the first ingredient here mm -hmm. is that is that um, galaxies host supermassive black. Uh, sorry, that that uh, galaxies evolve through mergers. We also know that galaxies host supermassive black holes. Um, for decades, um, we have observed these um, systems called active galactic nuclei, where you have a galaxy that's far away, and it's emitting a huge amount of energy. You see like radio lobes and X-ray lobes, just a huge amount of energy emission. Um, and the only plausible way to power that, that people can come up with is oh, there, there's a supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy and it's accreting matter and producing these giant jets and these giant emissions, this large amount of emission. Um, and uh, so, so this has been you know, thought that this is what was happening at the centers of galaxies now for, for several decades. More recently, this is a picture from, the picture on the, on the, on the right is a picture from um, the Event Horizon Telescope from 2019. This is a picture of the center of um, M87, which is a nearby elliptical galaxy. And it has, at the center, a six and a half billion solar mass black hole. And that's a picture of the black hole. So that dark spot in the, in the middle, that is the horizon 
of the black hole. That is the place from which light cannot escape. Um, and we have, s we have a, a, a other more recent pictures of our own, uh, of the, the, the supermassive black hole at the center of, of our own galaxy. I don't have a, a picture of that, but um, that was determined to be a black hole by Andrea Ghez and, and others um, uh, who during the course of two decades or so studied the orbit of, of, the, of stars around the center of our galaxy. So you look at the center of our galaxy, there's nothing there. But you see a bunch of stars orbiting around something. And by studying the motion of the stars, you can infer how much mass there is in the middle. Even though you see nothing, you can still, um, you can still um, see that. This, by the way, I, and I, and I kind of relearned this uh, like last week or something. The first person to propose a uh, black hole, uh, the existence of black holes, was this person called John Mitchell in like 17, in the 1780s. Um, and, uh, and the way that, uh, that he was proposing that we could find these was exactly this kind of, this, this kind of, uh, this kind of experiment. So you'll see an object orbiting around something else and you won't see what that is, what that object is that it's orbiting around. And that, that's what's going on at the center of our own Milky Way. So <coughs> if you put those two together, we have that galaxies um, host supermassive black holes and they grow through the history of cosmic time. They assemble to form larger and ever larger and larger structures through collisions. Um, so when galaxies collide, uh, we expect that the supermassive black holes, which they have at their centers, uh, will eventually meet one another, orbit around one another, and produce gravitational waves, similar to that animation that I showed you earlier. Except the, superma the black holes at the centers of galaxies, rather than being a few to a few tens of solar masses, like in, for in the case of LIGO, these are uh, 100 million to several billion or 10 billion solar masses each. And um, they produce uh, uh, different kinds of signals, these, these supermassive black holes. Um, I will just talk about the top two, the one that's in the red. Um, let me start with the green one first. So when the two supermassive black holes are far away from each other, they're just orbiting around each other and they're producing a kind of a sinusoidal wave, right? Just, just a wave that goes up and down, just like what you normally think of as a wave. Um, but there are many, many, many of these sources, hundreds of thousands to millions of these systems spread out throughout the universe. And all of those individual sinusoids added up together uh, form a stochastic background, this din, this hum of the universe. It's all, it, it is produced by all the supermassive black holes that are in binaries that are merging right now and emitting their gravitational waves towards us. And this is the signal that we believe we've detected. Um, there are other sources as well at the, at the frequencies that we're sensitive to, but I don't, I don't really want to want to spend a lot of time on that. Um, all right. So how do we actually detect these uh, gravitational waves? What, what is our apparatus? What, 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 what do we use? And, and, and the answer to this question is what uh, made me want to work in this field to begin with. Um, so it turns out that uh, nature has been very kind to us and provided us with a basically a set of clocks <laughs> that, that are spread out throughout our galaxy um, that are called pulsars. So pulsars are, uh, it's a type of neutron star um, and they, they have strong magnetic fields and they rotate around, they rotate around very rapidly. Um, and every, you know, uh, every so often you find one of these uh, neutron stars that it, it just so happens that the beam that comes out of its magnetic poles just sweeps past the Earth once in its rotation. And so when that happens, and you're pointing a radio telescope at it, you'll see just a blip, right? And the next time it rotates around, you'll see another blip, and then another blip. That's like the ticking of a clock. Um, and that is what we're going to exploit to, um, to make our, our gravitational wave, wave uh, detector. There are plenty of other reasons to study neutron stars. They're the sources of LIGO that I, the LIGO source that we detected that I, that I said we understood where gold comes from now and these heavy elements that are heavier than iron. Um, they're studied for all kinds of reasons. Um, you know, they're nuclear density objects. It's the size of a city, so say six miles uh, across, something like that, but it has a, a whole mass of the sun in it. So it's like nuclear density. So it's a very, very high density. They spin faster than a kitchen blender. So they're very interesting. Um, uh, 
It's a very interesting object to study. But from our point of view, we're just going to use them for the regularity. They just spin very, very regularly, so we're going to use them as ticking clocks that are spread out throughout the galaxy. <laughs> to measure those ticks, we need the best radio telescopes that we can get our hands on. And um, we are lucky to have access to these. Um, we were using the Arecibo Observatory, which unfortunately collapsed in December of 2020, but we still used, we had 15 years of data from that radio telescope, which, which, we, which we used in our latest analysis. Um, and we continue to use the, oh, I, I should say, this, this radio telescope is 300 meters across. That's three football fields. So this picture does not do it justice. This is a gigantic, amazing instrument. Um, uh, this radio telescope is a third of that size. So only 100 meters, only, in quotes, right? So this is just, just one football field in, you know, across that you can steer in any direction in the sky that you want and collect radio data from that sky direction that you're pointing in. Um, and, and these are, you know, you know the best or, or among the best radio telescopes in the world to do this kind of science, and we are very, very lucky to, to have access to them. Um, I should mention also, since we were talking about undergraduate research earlier, um, that our undergraduates, um, you know, f for a time, we're actually using Arecibo directly from, one, from a workstation at OSU to take data uh, for us, um, for, for our experiment. And we similarly, we continue to use, uh, we continue to use uh, Green Bank uh, for that, for pulsar searching. We also use the Very Large Array a little more recently and also, um, and also Chime. Um, and just, this is just a picture of our collaboration. There's about um, 200, I think it's actually closer to 300 we did, we did some, uh, since, we, uh, since we made our announcement, a lot of new people have joined. Um, so there's about 200 students and scientists. We're in the US and Canada. That's why we're called the North American <coughs> Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. Um, and we work with partners in Europe, Australia, China, South Africa. Um, and, um, and we are, um, as Aaron mentioned earlier, we're a physics frontier center. We were really lucky and we we got our first one in 2015, and we just renewed ours, well, just uh, in 2021, so about two, two and a half years ago or so. And what we're trying to do is build this, basically, what is a galactic, uh, a, a gravitational wave detector of galactic scale. So this animation, which was made by uh, an, a, an amazing human at NSF who does these kinds of animations, they asked us, um, where the locations of all our um, of all our pulsars were in the sky, and and, um, and so you'll see. I'll, I'll run this animation again, but you'll you can see it right at the beginning where the Earth is. It's right here, and then each of those kind of spinning, um, kind of line things. <laughs> uh, those those are the pulsars, and those are where the, where the pulsars actually are in the sky relative to us. The galaxy itself that it's overlaid on, we don't actually know that well how our galaxy looks like because we are in our galaxy and it makes it harder to, to figure that out. So we can see other galaxies very well, but our own is a little trickier. So that's more of an artist's impression-ish of, of, the, of, the, uh, of our galaxy. But where we are and where the pulsars are relative to us, that's all on a real scale. So this is a, a detector. It's made up of pulsars that we observe using radio telescopes. They are, you know, many, many, you know, thousands of light years away uh, of a size which is actually comparable to our galaxy itself. And so the way our experiment works is we have one or more gravitational wave sources that are emitting gravitational waves and they're passing through our galaxy and they're stretching and they're squeezing the galaxy as they're passing through. Um, and we can measure that by measuring those, the ticks of the clocks of these pulsars. If, if a gravitational wave is, is happens to be pushing a pulsar toward you, then those pulses will arrive a little bit earlier, and when it's moving away from you, they'll arrive a little bit later. Yep. So we can try to look for gravitational waves um, that way. So, so um, let me tell you a little bit about our, our uh, how, how much time do I have? I have about, probably about <coughs> 30 minutes. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, so I have a lot of time. So, so, so please ask, please ask questions. <laughs> I might be done a little bit. I might be done a little bit earlier than than uh, than I thought. Oh yeah, go ahead. Great. Beautiful instrument made out of these pulsars with a nanograph um, on that. I just wondered about whether these these gravity waves 
looks symmetrical from all angles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, two black holes. Yeah, so, so that, that's an excellent question. Um, and yes, it does depend on, there's many, so there are many things. So f there's a question about what the, what the, right. So the further away they are, the weaker they are. Um, and so, and it, the effect goes like one over the distance. So the, the weak, so, so, you know, if you make your, and, and this, is, this is important to understand, say how the sensitivity of a gravitational wave experiment might work. If I can increase my sensitivity by an order of magnitude, by a factor of 10, then I increase the volume that I have access to by a factor of a thousand, because volume goes like r cubed. So increasing your sensitivity is really good because the universe is roughly homogeneous. At least if you go, if you look far enough, it becomes homogeneous. So if you increase your the range at which you can look at by say a factor of two, you have eight times more sources. Right. So so that that's one thing that it depends on. Um, it absolutely depends on the geometry of the line of sight relative to what's emitting the gravitational waves, which, yeah. I, which is, I think, what you were alluding to. If you have a, if you have a, um, if you have a system which is where where you, the direction in which you're looking at is perpendicular to the plane in which they're moving, so that so you see two black holes and they're literally just going around circles around one another, and you see them yeah. head on, right? Yeah, um, that produces the largest gravitational waves. You could also see them edge on. And that produces the smallest amount of gravitational waves. And, and, and the reason that is is because the, the, the gravitational waves, the reason that happens is that the gravitational waves are, you know, are formed from the motion of those objects. So the more motion that you are able to observe, the more gravitational waves that you'll see coming, in your, coming your way. I mean... Yeah, yeah. Um, so you can do that. I don't know if you can do that with a single detector, but you can probably do it. I th it's a, another really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're going to need more than one detector to do this um, because you need to resolve, and this is getting a little bit technical, but you need to disentangle the polarizations of the gravitational. Um, and for that, I think you need you need more than one detector. But the effect definitely. But there's there's a third effect actually, also which is just just a geometrical one, which where the gravitational wave is coming from, relative to the geometry of your detector. Right. So for LIGO, it's where this where the V-shaped two arms of LIGO, where that V shape is relative to the, to the direction of the gravitational wave. Um, with, with pulsar timing, uh, you only have a line. And so it depends on where the gravitational wave is coming from relative to that, to that line. The, um, the subtlety about pulsar timing, uh, sort of a subtle effect that I think it's worth, it's worth explaining a little bit, is, is that the pulses um, you know, propagate from the pulsar to the Earth. And that sets up basically a preferred direction in the system. And so you might think to yourself, I thought, to, I thought this to myself when I first started working on this, that, okay, so you have a pulsar, you have the Earth, this is just a line. It shouldn't matter whether the gravitational waves are coming from behind the pulsar or from behind the Earth, right? You'd think that. Not true. <laughs> I thought that, and it was not true. Um, it, it, you know, and, and, and the reason for that is that, um, uh, you know, when, when, the, when the gravitational waves are coming from areas behind the pulsar, the, the, the pulses from the pulsar are actually surfing on top of the gravitational waves. And that does not happen when the gravitational waves are going in the opposite direction. So there's kind of a subtlety there that makes the response of your instrument to a gravitational wave different than we, what I, one, might have naively um, assumed. Oh, no, that, that's cool. I, I mean, I'm happy to, I'm happy to, to, to yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, keep, and keep, uh, keep, keep the questions coming, yeah. Uh, one more question from one of our one of our listeners in Curry campus, uh, Val asks, um, as, as a photon, do, do gravitons actually have waves and particle behaviors too, or do you? Um, we, I mean, probably. Um, you know, we need, a, a, that, th that would be my best guess, um, but we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. 
so so I don't I mean I think I think you can I I, I, th I think the, the very short answer is yes that they behave like particles and like waves depending on what just like light does um, yeah and in our case and I looked at this actually and you could do this back of the envelope with LIGO you know you know how much the mirrors are moving due to gravitational waves and you can figure out how much kinetic energy they have and how much kinetic energy they've absorbed from a pot from a graviton if that is indeed what's happening and it turns out that when you do that calculation you get less energy than a graviton and so you infer from that that what's actually happening is LIGO is not absorbing gravitons it's actually uh, scattering them it's kind of an interesting more technical thing but um um but yeah I mean I mean I, I would be very surprised if we I mean, I think everybody would be very surprised if, if it turned out that gravity um, and, and gravitons are not quanta-like photons. But I guess we don't know for sure. Um, yeah, so um, going back to, 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 the, to the experiment, and, and yeah, so and, and thanks, by the way. Th for those of you who are online, please feel free to send questions as well. Send questions along. I'll be happy to answer those as well, if I can. Um, Right, so, so as I mentioned earlier, our experiment takes a really long time. So we've been taking data actually since 2004. So, so, almost, so 20 years now, or almost 20 years. Um, and you know, so how, how do we take our data? Well, we have this radio telescope, we have a bunch of pulsars. We point our radio telescopes at a, at a pulsar and try to determine when the pulses from that pulsar are arriving. And we do that about once a month for all of our pulsars. Um, and what you see on that graph on the top left is each one of those points is, uh, is a different observation epoch. So this was when this corresponds to the time when we took the radio telescope and we pointed it at this pulsar and we took some data. Um, and so that tells you roughly the cadence of our observations. You can see along the vertical lines. Each, each vertical line corresponds to one pulsar. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and, um, and, and one thing we learned pretty early on is that it's really important to have as many pulsars as possible for this experiment. And obviously having more pulsars, more detectors is important because that so sort of trivially increases your sensitivity, right? You know, the more the more detectors you have, the better you do. Um, it turns out, and this is a little more this is a little bit more complicated to explain, and I will if you ask, um, but I won't otherwise, um, that it's not just better for the trivial reason that having more detectors is better. It's actually the only thing we can do to truly effectively increase our sensitivity to a stochastic background of gravitational waves, to this din, this humming of the universe that's coming from all the supermassive black holes that are emerging in the universe today. That din, the best way to detect it is by having as many pulsars as possible. So we, we did that. We discovered that in around 2012 or so, and we started increasing the number of pulsars as much as we could. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the some results that we had along the way. So, so um, the, the we had a, a five-year data release, a nine-year data release, and an 11-year 11, uh, 11 data release. And in for, the, for all of those, it ended up that we made no detection of anything. Now, when you don't detect something in an experiment, it is not as uninteresting as it sounds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because what you do is you set something called upper limits. So you say, well, th I'm not detecting anything. So that means I can rule out any sources that would have pr would have resulted in a detectable signal in my instrument, right? If I can I can rule out all you know some, if there's some astrophysics model involving supermassive black holes that says oh you should be observing a background of this really large amplitude, and you're observing nothing, then you can rule that model out, right? The, it, it, you know, think things to to do it well is a little bit more technical, but that's the basic idea. Even when you don't detect something, you can still do an interesting thing. Say something about the world say something about the universe. Um, and um, yeah, so, so we, set, we set up our limits for the, first, for the first three of these data sets. Um, for the 11 year, something really, really interesting happened. Um, the, the first thing that happened was that um, uh, we, actually were, we actually thought we did detect something. It was weak, it wasn't like super significant, but we actually did see kind of a signal. And, um, and then you know, we did what we, uh, you know, every, person needs to do when they think they've detected something important or, or less important, whatever, you try to get rid of it, right? So we tried all kinds of things to get rid of this thing. Um, and eventually we were able to get rid of it. 
Uh, but it, and, it, and it is the way that we got rid of it that is, that is really interesting. Um, it turns out that we need to keep track of the ticking of all those clocks, the, the stars, the neutron stars that are, that are essentially our clocks. We need, to, we need to choose an inertial frame in which to say, this is when this tick arrives. Um, at our at and, and this inertial frame is, is the center of mass of the solar system. All right? Now, it turns out our solar system is actually orbiting around the galaxy every 220 million years or so, so it's not quite an inertial frame, but it's close enough. So we need an inertial frame, a, a frame of reference which is non-accelerating, to do our calculation of when the tick should arrive. That's the easiest way we can write down that, that formula. So, and so in order to calculate that center of mass of the solar system, we need to know where all the planets are, how massive they are, right? How big they are and, 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 and where they are. So of the sun and all the planets and, and all the so, uh, solar system objects. The people who have that information is NASA because they send things to planets all the time, so they need to know where they are. And so they have these, these, um, these um, things called solar system ephemerides, that's what this word means, that basically tells you at any one time where Mars and Jupiter and whatever are, you know, at any time and how fast they're moving. Um, that's so they can send a probe to, to you know, Jupiter or whatever. Um, and, and we were using NASA data to calculate the center of mass. And what we found, so NASA changes these versions as they update their missions, as they get more data, they change these solar system ephemerides. And what we found was that when we changed those versions of the file that we got from NASA, we got different results. And there were some where the signal was stronger and some where the signal was weaker. And we tracked this down to the orbital parameters of Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is, is the second most massive object in the solar system. To a good approximation, for what we do at least, the solar system is just the sun and Jupiter. Um, you know, that to, to, to an excellent approximation. Um, and, but they were, they were having prob we were having problems. Different, different versions of this solar system ephemerides were giving you different uh, results for the position and for the motion of Jupiter, you know, for, for, the, for the mass and the velocity and the position of Jupiter. And those were changing our results. So what did we do? We just built that in. We took all the data. We said, let's not just try to find gravitational waves and do all this. Let's also find out what the orbital parameters of Jupiter are in our t from our data. We did that, and when you incorporated that, um, the, the signal goes away. The, the really cool thing about this is that the, the, you know, the, the actual change in the location of the solar system center of mass between one version and another was 100 meters. I mean, I don't, it, the, the, the solar system, I mean, the universe is, of course, the solar system is already unimaginably large. <laughs> Um, the, the distances involved are incredible. And, 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 and we were sensitive to changes in where we calculated that center of mass of the solar system to be, to be 100 meters. Uh, and I, uh, anyway, I find that maybe, hopefully you find it equally as fun and compelling as I do. I, I, I like to tell the story, because it, it really, even though we weren't detecting anything, we were still sensitive to these kind of crazy thing. Like, this is the size of our radio telescope, which is, which is nothing compared to the distance between the sun and Jupiter, or the size of Jupiter, or the size of the sun, or any other scale that you can think of in the solar system. Um, so that was pretty cool. Then, um, the same thing again happened in our 12 year, 12 and a half year data set. We once again found, uh, um, we once again found another signal, which looked a lot like this, the signal that we were finding in the 11 year data. So we were observing some kind of process, the, some noise process that was there. Um, and, and it had the same spectral properties. And we were, it took us three years to publish this because we could not get rid of it. We were just complete, we tried everything. You know, of course we tried the, we were, oh, maybe this is another solar system ephemeris. Nope, not that. Um, we threw everything we had at it and it was not going away. Finally, what we did <laughs> was, all right, well, why don't we just take a peek at you know, we, we, because it took us so long to analyze the 12-year data set, we already had a couple more years, a few more years of data in the bag. So it's like, can we quickly put these together to see if this is gravitational waves? And we started to see the correlations. And we we're like, phew, okay, this thing is not some systematic noise source that is going to completely destroy our experiment. This, in fact, was the first hints of 
a gravitational wave stochastic background, but we couldn't say so because we weren't finding um, a, a particular signature, which are the correlations. And I'm going to spend just the, the, the next couple of minutes um, explaining what, what, what that is. So why do we expect our signal to be correlated? So if we go back to our animation, um, if, you, if you imagine you have two pulsars that are where the top blue mass are, right? They're moving away from us and toward us, basically uh, in the same way, right? So if you have two pulsars and the Earth in the middle, they would just be being pulled away and being squeezed and pulled away and being squeezed. Um, and so the correlations are positive and they're the largest correlations that you can have. That's, this is the, the, the uh, on the y-axis you have the, the, um, the correlation, the arrival time correlation between pulsars as a function of the pulsar separation in the sky. So zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees. This is this so, so you take two points in the you take two points on a sphere, you can always calculate an angular separation and express that in degrees. And it turns out the only thing that so there's a correlation that is produced by gravitational waves, which depends on the angular separation between the two pulsars. So when the two pulsars are where that top blue uh, mass is, they will both be receding away from us or approaching us at the same time. So they will both be either advanced or delayed, depending on what the gravitational wave is doing. Now consider two pulsars that are at 90 degrees to one another. So that would be like the top blue mass and the blue mass on the, uh, on the right, for example. Those are at 90 degrees to each other, right? Then as, as a gravitational wave is passing through, one of the pulsars is being pushed, uh, um, pulled toward you and the other one is being pushed away from you and then you wait a little bit and the opposite. Um, and that means that when one of the pul when when the when one of the pul when the pulses from one of the pulsars is being advanced, the other one is being delayed, and vice versa, because they're moving in opposite directions, and that's why you have a negative correlation here. That's what negative correlation means. It means that when one is being delayed, the other one's being advanced, and vice versa. Um, and and similarly, uh, if you have them at 180 degrees near 180 degrees. Um, you have you can look at the top blue mass and the bottom blue mass, and they're also they're also positively correlated. Now, I've given you kind of a qu uh, qualitative argument for why you should expect this shape, why you would have positive correlations where the pulsars are close together, negative correlations where they're at 90 degrees, and positive correlations again when they're at 180 degrees. There's other things going on in this curve, like the fact that correlations at 180 degrees are not as big as uh, at zero degrees, and I can explain that if you ask, um, but I, I won't unless, unless you do so. But this, this correlation signature was calculated in, in the early 80s by um, Hellings and Downs as the signature of gravitational waves, right? So it's not enough that you're detecting this kind of process in your pulsars, this extra noise in your clocks. This, this, these, uh, the arrival times and devi uh, the deviations in your arrival times have to be correlated between pulsars in this very particular way in order for us to really call it a, a gravitational wave signal. And because we want to, you know, each, each, um, each pair of pulsars give you, gives you a particular angle, angular separation in the sky, right? You have a pair over here, then maybe another pair over here, and so on. And, 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 uh, and each of these pulsars gives you a different angular separation. So you want as many pulsars as possible to populate points on the x-axis here of angular separation and calculate those pairwise correlations between pulsars for as many angular separations as possible. And when we did that, this is what we got. So that is, that is the, the it didn't always look like this. <laughs> there, were, uh, there was much work going along the way, but this is the, this is the pattern that we observed um, in our data uh, when we were looking, when we were peeking at, you know, when we were doing the 12 and a half year data set and we were really confused and we got, we, we, we produced a preliminary version of this and we saw that kind of U-shaped, uh, U-shaped uh, uh, kind of curve that um, that told us that this was that this was um, that this was a gravitational wave background. This was a stochastic background of, of gravitational waves. 
Um, and this was for you know, the, uh, the specifics of this. We had 67 pulsars and 15 years of data. Um, there's not, you know, there's not of order 67 squared points on this. That's because we take yeah. angular bins and we kind of cluster, cluster pairs of pulsars together to form this plot. Um, so, um, but yeah, we, that, was, that was basically our, that was basically the, the correlations that we saw. And uh, so I'll just end here with what we're gonna be doing in the future. Um, the, 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 not now that we've, we've uh, detected the signal, I, I, I've said several times during this talk that this is probably uh, produced by supermassive black holes. That's our sort of, um, <laughs> so mergers of supermassive black holes are the most pedestrian explanation that we have for this signal. So it's not particularly pedestrian. These are billion solar mass objects, blah, blah, blah. Um, there are other things that it could be. And we unfortunately at this moment cannot rule out a whole set of other things, things like cosmic strings and phase transitions and high energy physics ideas that may be happening in the early universe that produce a signal at the frequencies that we have sensitivity to. Um, uh, so we are not able to, to rule those out yet. So I, I, my money is on supermassive black holes, but we can't say for sure that it's not something more exotic, more, um, more, more exotic than supermassive black holes, or even more exotic than supermassive black holes. Um, so uh, what we need to do now is we're gonna be producing even more data. We are collaborating with our, um, we're collaborating with our international partners on this. We're gonna put all our data together, um, and that should be happening over the time scale of a year or so. When we do that, not only we will detect those correlations more significantly, but we'll also be able to get, um, characterize the spectrum of the signal better. And this, what I mean by the spectrum is, how much power do you have at each gravitational wave frequency? That's what a spectrum is. Um, and by looking at that, we can then say, oh, this is definitely uh, supermassive black holes or definitely cosmic strings or some other thing. Like I said, probably supermassive black holes. Um, uh, then, uh, yeah, so we found the signal, but now we need to actually study it. We need to refine our measurements of what we've done. We, we, this, is, this is, detecting the signal is not the end. It is the beginning, right? Now, now, we, now, we, now we have the signal. We can actually study it and better characterize it. Um, another thing that's super interesting, um, I think, is that, so I, I mentioned, you know, if, as I think, it's the, the background is due to, to all, you know, say hundreds of thousands or millions of, of supermassive black hole binary system spread out across our universe, right? That's producing this din that we're detecting, this slow rumbling um, uh, of, of space-time that we detected. Um, uh, if it's produced by supermassive black holes, then it just by chance there happens to be a binary system that is either sufficiently nearby and or sufficiently massive, so sufficiently big in mass, um, then it will stick up above the background. It's as though you have so you know, you enter a room, say, and you hear a lot of conversations, and you can't make out an individual one, but if there's a group of people that are talking particularly close to you, you can pick out what they're actually saying. So it's a little bit like that. You can make out that conversation um, uh, because, because you happen to be near them. Uh, so this is a little bit like that, and just by chance, we expect there to be a handful of these systems that are sufficiently either nearby, or some combination of nearby and large enough that, that their signal is, uh, is, is audible above the din, right? Um, and when we, when we detect these, um, we, we expect like it's, it's something like five or so systems in the next uh, six years or so, as we continue taking data, um, we're gonna be able to do something really amazing with these, uh, which is to study them both in gravitational waves and then we can point other, uh, other telescopes at these, electromagnetic telescopes, optical telescopes, radio telescopes, x-ray telescopes, whatever it is, at those sources to try and better characterize them and better understand them. And this sort of mirrors what LIGO did with the binary neutron star that I showed yeah. at the very beginning of my talk. They found a gravitation, they find the gravitational signal, they found a, um, a, um, a gamma ray signal, and then it was followed up over the following weeks with other observations using other kinds of, 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 um, of, um, of wavelengths of light to, to look at the system. So there's very exciting, this, is this kind of, this kind of astronomy, when you try to observe a system with, a di with different messengers, with different, like in this case, you study them using gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves, which is light. 
um, and electromagnetic waves at many different wavelengths. That's called multi-messenger astronomy. So that uh, so there's a, a, a lot of exciting uh, multi-messenger uh, astronomy potential that we are looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a, I don't know who's gonna moderate this, but we do have a question. So we only have the one microphone. Okay, oh. You know, I, I, I can try to use the, um, oh, no, this is locked. Okay, well. <laughs> you wanna help them? Okay, if you just wanna raise your hand. Again? Okay, no, I Anyone else want to hop in ahead of me? So I have one more question. I'm obviously gravity waves, they're very subtle. I can't feel them as they pass through me. But maybe if I was much closer, I would. Um, is there some equation I could look up that would tell me what the strain is, say, 10 feet from the event horizon at the time of the collision of two supermassive black holes? Would it be something you could perceive if you were standing there? Would it actually break bombs or explode quickly out or something like that? Yeah, um, this is totally giving me. system goes like, that, that, um, that effect goes like one over the distance. So if you get sufficiently close to the system, you might be getting stretched and squeezed in a way that doesn't feel very good. Yeah. Um, I haven't done the numbers for this, uh, but they can be. Now that I'm thinking about it, which is that you have to be in something called the wave zone to do the calculation. And, and so you, don't, you can't get super close to the source and still call what you're receiving waves. So that's a little bit subtle. Uh, and I don't know whether, what, if, you're, if you're out in the wave zone, well, then nothing would happen. So I, I'm not 100%. I would have to calculate it. That's a more interesting sounding than I expected. I'm curious how. We have one online, or a couple of them actually. Are you stating the pulsar correlation is a universal rule? Um, it is universal to gravity, uh, Einstein gravity, specifically. So, yeah, I love all these questions. Um, uh, th this curve here, assume that Einstein's theory of general relativity is correct. Um, there are reasons to think about alternatives to Einstein's theory of gravity. Um, you've probably heard of this, there's dark energy, which is expand more quickly than we thought. There's dark matter, which I still think there really is dark matter. It's not, you, you shouldn't be changing gravity for this, although some would disagree. Um, and then of course we can't quantize gravity, right? So those are three kind of, those are, those are like probably the three biggest that face modern physics today. Like what is dark matter? What is dark energy? And why can't we can't quantize gravity? Right? The, 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 those are, at least in my mind, those are the three biggest things. Um, and the answer to one or more of those may be in, well, Einstein didn't get it totally right. How do we test this? How do, how do we check this? Um, one way to try to check this is by looking at gravitational waves. So different theories of gravitational waves may produce different signatures. And in particular, so I'm gonna go even earlier, which is more, more helpful. So this, this, this um, cartoon that I showed, that I said, oh, there's a gravitational wave going into the board, and the stretching and squeezing this ring of particles, right? So that, that is true in Einstein gravity, but if in other theories of gravity, um, you might have heard of these, some of you might have heard of something called brand sticky theory. If you haven't heard of it, don't worry about it. Um, but they can produce other motions. So in particular, this theory that I just mentioned, 
there's something called a breathing mode where the ring of particles gets stretched out and then squeezed. But the whole thing at once, right? So, so the particulars of how masses respond to, or what kinds of gravitational waves there are, what they do to a ring of masses, depends on your theory of gravity. Um, and so that's one of the things that one, uh, a couple of, uh, I've had a couple of graduate students work on uh, over the years uh, on, this, on this exact question is what are the signatures and you know, how, do we, how do we best perform a search for these other kinds of motions of, these, of our pulsars, right? And what kind of correlations do they result in that, that U-shaped thing that changes if you have a different theory of gravity because that really depends very heavily on this, on this particular motion. So yeah, I don't know, that's kind of a long-winded answer. I've got a couple more online, but does anybody here have a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm hoping this might help other people understand the presentation too. Um, so the LIGO experiment, though the frequency of those waves are, you said, on the in the scope of versus the experiment that you did over 15 years. So we we're talking about the really long, right? really long periods or, yeah, yeah. It really goes to what gravitational wave free in that much detail, well, in any detail, really. I just want to know, you know, LIGO could see black holes of these masses and we can see black holes of these other masses. And I didn't really explain why that was. Right. Let me start by at least giving you the numbers for this. To and a few hundred hertz. That turns the range of frequencies at which two black holes will eventually merge. Right. So, so what's the, what stops the merger? So, black holes have a finite size, and what stops their merger is that they eventually meet each other, and they can't. If they were if they were point particles, they, that chirp would basically go on forever. But they're not point particles, they're finite size objects. Eventually, you know, they, they, the, 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 the systems, you know, they're orbiting around one another faster and faster and faster, emitting ever strong gravitational waves decaying, and eventually they meet. And when they meet, at what frequency they meet, what frequency was the last wave that what they emitted has to do with the size, because that's when they touch, and the effect stops. This is, so, so our black holes are like billion solar mass black holes. They're these very large objects, that will coalesce before ever reaching a frequency you can see black holes at. Right? So, the, so LIGO's black holes are small, and so they get to higher frequencies, and that's why they're able to detect them. Our black holes are really, really large. And so they merge well before they can reach a frequency where LIGO is sensitive to. I, I, I'm not sure that was what you were asking, but that was. Uh, I think so. You're measuring your pulsars all over this universe. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and there, there are these ten. So, so right. So the, the animation I showed with the galaxy and all that stuff. I mean, that's happening very slowly. That's like a. So the galaxy is being stretched and squeezed by these gravitational waves, but over you know 15 years. Yeah. So it's like a very, very slow kind of stretching and squeezing, and that that's the effect that we measured. Yeah. So when you say nanohertz, do you really mean? Do you have a direct like? I, I, nano is like 10 to the minus nine. Right. So. So 10. So that's like. Um, so 10 to the minus 9 hertz, that corresponds to about um, like 30, 30 years. Or 30 years. 30 years long. So these one nanohertz a, is 30 years. Yeah. A comment online is pulsars at 180 degrees and 90 degrees are negatively correlated. Um, the ones at 180 degrees are po positively correlated. At 90 degrees, they're negatively correlated. Yeah, uh, exactly up right now. Yeah, so uh, at, eight, at uh, zero degrees, they're together in the sky, they're really close together, they're both approaching in the same way, right? When they're at 90 degrees, I'm not sure I could do this, right? <laughs> I'm not sure I'm <laughs> doing this, right? When they're at 90 degrees, just look at the, the two blue masses there. That's what this is. When one of them is receding, the other one is receding, and vice versa. That means that when when the ticks of one of the clocks is advancing, the other one is going more slowly, and, and vice versa. Getting, you, you know, as, as one of your pulses is approaching you, you're getting the the pulses earlier than you would 
And at the same time as this is happening, this is happening. So this, the pulses from this other pulsar are getting to you later, and, and so on. So they're opposite. So the signs of the deviations are opposite. Right? So that, imagine, you, imagine they're just sitting there like this, right? Then you're just hearing tick, 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 and they're both ticking at the same time. Now a gravitational wave comes in, and they start doing this, and this, and this, and that. Then when one of them is approaching you, the pulses will arrive sooner. The other one's receding away from you, so the pulses arrive later. are at 180 degrees, <laughs> approaching you, receding away from you at this, in the same way. And so, so it's a positive. And by the way, the reason that biggest, uh, an effect when they're at 180 degrees is for the reason that I alluded to earlier for the other question, which is that in fact there's a preferred direction in the system. And so it's not, there's not symmetry between zero degrees and 180 degrees for that reason. Is there a Doppler effect in gravity waves? Absolutely, yeah. So, so in fact, um, the calculation to the effect is the Doppler effect. Uh, oh, you mean of gravity waves or? Yeah, so shift in the, in the photons that the pulsar is emitting, so the you know, radio waves are photons. Um, and they can also get blue shifted and red shifted depending on the motion of the, of the object. So there's a, if there's a binary system, for example, that is approaching you, uh, just because it just happens to be doing that, then you will see higher frequency waves than, it's, than if it's receding away from you, or you will see lower frequency gravitational waves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we've got one more online. What fraction of gold comes from supernova versus neutron star collision? And I'm also going to go ahead and hand you this because they're having a hard time hearing you. Another, you all, you all have really great questions. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it's the majority of gold. There is some amount of gold that comes. You can, you can look this up. Um, so I would just Google this uh, if I wasn't here trying to answer the question. Um, uh, so, so, but I, I think it's the majority of gold. That, that, that's what we learned, right? There's some fraction of elements that are coming from different astrophysical processes. And the real question was how much comes from supernova and how much comes from binary neutron star collisions. And what this, the fact that we were able to observe one, that makes it so that the rate is sufficient. We know that they're occurring often enough that we are able to detect the one. And so that told us that therefore the majority of gold comes from uh, the exact percentage, I don't know. But, but it, is, it is the majority. Yeah, so we actually have, I mean, we have a group that meets um, every week. Um, and we do, you know, especially after COVID, there's a lot of Zooming <laughs> uh, for the, that goes on with these meetings. Uh, and so people are welcome to join. Um, if they want to get the, the thing, the, the, the kind of entry level project is, is Pulsar searching. So you look through, you know, we do radio telescope observations, not just for, figuring out when the ticks are arriving, but also just to find new pulsars. Um, and we take that data, we process it, and we produce these images. And we need, to, we need humans to look at those images and decide whether is this possibly a pulsar? Should we spend more telescope time to follow this particular candidate up? That's a decision that humans make, and the, the specific humans are undergraduates <laughs> that we have at OSU, among others. There's, there's a group of about 100 of these across the country. So people are definitely welcome to join. If, if, if uh, if, if, if people are interested in searching for pulsars and, you know, we have a weekly meeting, we talk about random astronomy news and, um, and, and sometimes other things, but we have like a little kind of a presentation and then usually some kind of um, uh, maybe a little tutorial about how to do pulsar searching um, and, then, and then discussions about candidates that people have found. Is this a pulsar? Is this not a pulsar? What is this? Um, so that, that I, I mean, just, just shoot me an email. Are interested. Question I know I've asked a lot, but uh, do you mind? Yep. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, and I don't totally understand, but you talked about LIGO apparently is scattering gravitons. Yeah. Would you change about a gravity wave detector if you want? 
funded the product of your design? How would you change the design to, to make it interact a little bit more strong? I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty hard to catch gravitons because they interact very weakly. Maybe no one does. Um, but I, I don't know. Maybe it's possible to do this. It might, I, yeah. yeah. I, I can't answer that, that question, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I think for, tho for those particular models, the correlation is always positive. So you, would, you don't have a negative correlation. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, good, yeah, that's a, that's a very astute uh, observation, yeah. Disprove that then? Sorry? Can you disprove the breathing? Well, I think, I think it disproves everything being a breathing mode, um, but it doesn't disprove combinations. Like there could still be a small breathing mode contribution to this, to this curve. And you know, the error bars on this are still pretty big as you can tell. Um, and so it, it turns out, I, I, can, I can explain how the breathing mode looks like. It's a line that starts at a half, if I just remember it off the top of my head. Um, and then at around 90 degrees, it goes down to, and it kind of asymptotes to zero. So it's very large at low angular separations, and then it kind of dies away at high angular separations. And, and you can't infer that from that, um, from that diagram, by the way. Um, um, uh, it's, it's, because it's because when you, ca when you do the calculation for this curve, you're, what you're doing is, a, is an average over gravitational waves from all directions in the sky for a particular angular separation of two pulsars. And so it gets a little tricky. Like uh, your intuition, you know, the intuition using that, that animation that I showed and how the th things are positive over here, negative over here, and positive again over here, that is very nice that this works <laughs> because the calculation that one actually needs to do is, 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 is complicated. Yeah. Is there any significance if you look at these yellow trail bars and you go to the third one from the left, third one to the right, they're both. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, we we don't know. Um, um, we we don't. I mean, you know, we uh, as scientists, we're sort of um, kind of um, you know try try to be conservative as much as possible, and sort of like what we not 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 like politically. I mean, just in our assumptions about you know. What we what we assume about the world, um, you know, if you look at these points, those are one those are called one sigma error bars, uh, and one sigma means that sixty seven percent of the time you expect to agree with the blue curve, and that's approximately what you see here. So we do see a deviation, but we have like fifteen points, like three or four of them maybe don't agree that well at low angular separations, but that's about what you expect when you're plotting one sigma error bars. Some percentage of the time, it's not going to agree. So it's it's statistically um, consistent, um, but it could point to something else. Um, there is a whole lot of uh, modeling of each of the pulsars that we have to do. Pulsars don't just have gravitational waves; they have all kinds of other noise that we have to model. We model a lot of things in this that I've kind of swept under the rug when I described all this. They're not the most perfect clocks either. Um, so we do a lot of modeling to try and model all the other n sources of noise in the pulsar at the same time as we search for gravitational waves. And it could be that we haven't done such a great job of that. Um, if I were to s say anything right now, that would be my suspicion, is that there's something that we haven't done quite right, um, that when we improve our modeling and we understand our pulsars a little bit better, that this will probably go away. If it's not just a statistical fluke, uh, if it really is a thing, then the thing it probably is, is is us not modeling the pulsar super well. That would be my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. 
Um, if we're looking at two marketing black holes from um, two different plane perspectives, so like if we're if we're here and the black holes marketing are over here, um, is there a difference in how they would be detected if they were um, moving in the x y direction instead of like the x z direction? Yeah, that's another great question. Yeah, absolutely. So so if they're moving. Right, so I think, let me just draw a picture to your thing. Suppose, you know, you're seeing them where you are, right? And you're seeing them do this versus seeing them do this, right? Is that, is that, is that about right? Yeah, um, so, so th th absolutely. So, so the motion of, the, of objects uh, directly couples to the gravitational waves that you're observing. And in this case, you're going to see a lot more motion than in this case, right? And here there's just a couple of things that are moving backwards and forwards. There there's two things that are moving around in a circle, more or less, around their center of mass. Um, and, and, um, and, and this is gonna produce more gravitational waves than this, all other things being equal, because you see more motion. Yeah. The gravitational waves propagate from the pole center of the, of the location? Right, so the, the gravitational waves are produced by the motion of these two objects, and then they spread out at the speed of light. They go away from the objects that are producing them at the speed of light, and then they reach us. And the particular pattern that you see of gravitational waves depends on how you're, like it's gonna be different if you're looking at it sort of uh, face down or, 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 from or, or, or edge on. They're just gonna be different patterns that you're gonna observe. And in particular, that one is weaker than that one. The, the one on the right is a little bit weaker. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, awesome question, so.